good morning. It's the day after the big fishing trip to Beaver Dam. I made a video yesterday uh, about inflatable boats and I mentioned going online to learn how to scull a boat. Well, as an afterthought, I went online just to see how easy that would be. And the method I'm talking about, I could not find. I found out how to scull one of those fancy Ivy League racing boats. I found out how to scull a boat like they do in the Far East, where you stand up in the back of a, a fancy skiff and just move the paddle back and forth. No, what I'm talking about, and I'll demonstrate it in a minute, it's just a simple matter of using a paddle with one hand. Now this paddle, since I don't do any sculling these days, is a little too long. This is a four foot paddle. Ideally, you would want a paddle that you can grasp near the blade. You know, you want to have the blade in the water, so it depends on how much side you have on your boat. But anyhow, you're going to be pretty close to the blade in most cases. And then on the other end, ideally, you would have it to where that, that handle rests just above your elbow. If you were to bend your elbow, it would be right about there. I mean, it doesn't hurt for it to be longer, but it just kind of gets in the way sometimes. You know, it's just a distraction. So if you're going to do some sculling, uh, if you have a high wall boat, maybe four foot's good for you. If you've got uh, a typical little John boat, like a little wooden skiff or aluminum John boat. I'm not talking about a V-hull, I'm talking about just a flat bottom John boat where you can sit right up in the front. Then probably a three footer is going to be okay. But uh, I'll go ahead and, and demonstrate how I skull a boat. And, it, and it's really not unpleasant you know it seems like a lot of trouble paddling a boat with one hand <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> but once you get that boat in motion i would i would say it's sort of like pushing somebody on a swing set you know it, it may take a little bit of effort the first couple of pushes but after that you could just swing somebody with a couple of fingers you know, once they build up that momentum, and same thing on a boat. Well, I'll never have any traffic on this road as soon as I turn my camera on this busy street. Yeah, so uh, once you get that boat in motion, it's going to be so sweet. You'll be able to reach forward because you're going to be sitting at the very front of the boat unless you're an inflatable boat. We'll talk about that later. And then you're just going to make a gentle pull back towards the, the front of the boat. And then after you complete that stroke, don't lift the paddle out of the water. What you want to do, this is crazy. Yeah, after you pull the boat ahead, just twist your wrist and turn that paddle uh, parallel with the direction of travel. And there would be no resistance on the paddle. You can just reach right back out with it, keeping it underwater the whole time. So it's a very smooth stroke, almost like you learn in life-saving class uh, when you were taking your swimming lessons as a kid. If you were going to rescue your partner and you had to go and do a cross-chest carry, and then you would side-stroke your way back, well, that's pretty much what you're doing. You're just side-stroking. And you'll find that once you get that boat going, it's, it's going to be sweet once you, you, you practice this technique. You won't even have to push the paddle forward. Much like a sailboat can tack against the wind, you know, if you have forward motion with that boat and after you've made your pull and you turn your wrist, you can actually have that, that paddle ang angled just perfectly where the forward motion of the boat actually pulls that paddle ahead of the boat. It sounds crazy, but think of it like flying a kite or something. Get out on the water and try it. You'll see what I'm talking about. So it's going to be reach out, pull, turn your wrist, let the blade go back out front, not above the water. You're going to be underwater this whole time. And back. Very smooth. All right, I'm going to sit up in my boat and see if that makes, makes it any clearer to you. Stand by.
Now this is not the ideal boat to be sculling around. This is my little Tritanic 10 foot bass raider made by Pelican. Uh, but I can scull this boat. I just don't have a need for it because every time I put it in the water I've got a motor on the back. But I can show you something about the design of boats in general. When you're sculling you always want to scull from the front. As you can see how there's an angle to the hull in the front. Even on these uh, pontoon style style rigs, you know, it, it's, it's an angle. It wants to glide forward as compared to the stern, which even on a pontoon boat is sort of blunt. That's more than blunt. That's about twice the width of a boat paddle. So if you're trying to pull a boat with a paddle that's only half the size of each of these pontoons in the back, you're going to find that, that you're really going uphill with that. And uh, you don't have to worry about that too much with, a, with an inflatable boat because even though it looks like the bottom is ribbed once you get that thing inflated, it's not. Once you get that in the water and get a little weight in there, you may as well be sitting on a darn rubber ball. You can, pout, you can skull a, a, a uh, inflatable boat backwards, forwards, even sideways. Okay, let me climb up up here in my boat, hang my camera over here, and maybe you can see uh, a little better the technique I'm talking about, how to scull a boat. And remember, you're always going to scull from the front of the boat. Alright, this is as far forward as my chair will go in this particular boat, but, but this would still be okay. I may even decide to sort of sit sideways. On a John boat, most John boats, traditional John boats, have that little tiny seat right up in the bow. We always call it the kid's seat. That's the perfect location for sculling a boat. Because when you're up in the kid's seat, instead of going down the side of the boat, you can pretty much reach out to the front of the boat. But here's the stroke I'm talking about. You're just going to have the paddle down in the water and you just make a very smooth stroke, turn your wrist down, your hand, the palm down, and just let the, the blade glide back up to the front very slowly. A little bit of practice and this will make a lot of sense to you. Now that's how I would scull this boat if I was in a, an old wooden John boat where I could sit up front. I would be doing this from the front. And it's pretty nice because it gives you the chance to fish with your left hand. You know you take a fly rod out there with a popper on it. You're not going to be able to strip line but you can sure do that. Alright, let me get down where I can talk to you. I've got two remote cam uh, remote controls for this camera and I haven't hooked either one of them up. That's me. I know my photography skills probably drive you up a wall. I'm not a photographer, never claimed to be. I don't even know why I started doing this. I think it was just for when I first got on Facebook. Anyhow, you know, $40 camera. I do have a microphone, a three foot cord. Now, I don't know why you need a three foot cord uh, for a camera. You know, I mean, I can, I can talk three feet without the microphone. But I got a 20 foot cord and I can't get it to work. But anyhow, uh, let me show you this stroke again where I'm gripping the paddle down, you know, as, as low as necessary to, to keep the, the paddle in the water. You know, what you learn from physics class about fulcrums and levers, the higher up you hold this paddle, the heavier it's going to seem. 
right? You can do that with a broomstick if you don't have a paddle. The closer you hold it to the straw, the lighter it's going to be. Same thing, even though you're not fighting gravity when you're sculling a boat, you may as well assume that the resistance of that water is the same thing as gravity. So, you know, if you hold the paddle all the way up here at the end and you try and paddle a boat, you're going to get tired real quick. So you want to hold down, rest the back of the paddle behind your forearm, make a very smooth stroke. As you complete the stroke, turn the paddle back out. You don't have to go fast. You don't want to be doing this kind of crazy stuff. It's very smooth strokes. And you'll be shocked just how quickly you can get this boat moving comfortably and be able to steer it. I mean, you don't always have to make a, a straight pull. You know, sometimes you may want to pull a little bit closer towards the boat as opposed to alongside of it. And that will help turn you to port. Conversely, you know, you can make your stroke and then end up with a little push to, to your left side and that will move the front of the boat to starboard. That will be real handy if you're uh, in a cypress swamp, which is where I mostly fished when I was younger. And uh, it allows you to go in and out of those cypress, cypress trees. It's a lot easier to maneuver from the front than it is with a motor on the back. We can talk about that a little bit here. I've mostly been discussing John Boat techniques. It's like playing poker. You know, once you learn the basics of poker, then you can do some modifications to play games other than the standard five card draw. So everything I'm talking about for a John Boat can be applied to an inflatable boat. When I was growing up, I always called it a raft because anytime I saw an inflatable boat, I always thought of it as a life raft to be used only in emergencies. Nobody would consider using that for fun. Heck no, not when the alligators are crawling, crawling around within five or six feet of you down there. But it's a different world today. And, you know, if you're going to fish out of a John boat, if you've got one of those old wooden John boats, hey, that's fine. You can sit right up there on the front in the baby seat perfect for sculling but if you've got one of the newer aluminum john boats and it might have a baby seat up there when you sit up there it's liable to raise the back end of that lightweight boat right up in the air so if you don't have a motor on the back go ahead and get you a styrofoam chest or something put some water in it you know water weighs close to eight eight pounds a gallon you know you put your five gallons of water in there and sort of way down in the back or take a partner with you take your wife or your or your kid with you let them sit in the back you get up front and stir them around for a day's fishing but uh you know that's all common sense here comes more traffic may as well be proud of all this busyness we got going on today like being on Beaver Dam on the road to nowhere. This is a road to nowhere. But uh, anywho, been talking about John boat designs or my little pontoon boat, you know, a Pelican Bass Raider, Bass Hunter design. But the same principles apply if you're fishing out of one of these inflatable boats. And the nice thing about an inflatable boat is you can sit just about anywhere in it. When I first got mine, I would I would sit right in the middle and paddle this way. I'd be sitting right here and I'd be paddling like that. I would not be at the at the bow or the stern. And that allowed me to put a fishing pole you know here and here left and right and I would I was within arm's reach of my fishing pole and I would just uh, skull upwind and once I reached the stopping point I just turned the boat around and let the wind blow us back the other way and then I made a uh, not a wind sock but whatever you call those things that you use out in the ocean a sea anchor 
I made one just by using the uh, using one of those little mesh bags, wire mesh bags that you would use to put your catch in. You know the kind I'm talking about. They're collapsible. Well, I would just, uh, if I had a couple of fish, I'd have them in the basket. And I could just throw that over the sides of my inflatable boat. And I could adjust the position where I tied it onto the boat to accommodate for any wind anomalies or whatever, or current. And I could just get a perfect drift every time. It, it was a sweet deal. It's a sweet deal if you're young. But it doesn't, I would say it's not even as difficult. Or it's just about the same degree of difficulty sculling as it is just paddling a boat with two hands. You know, there's a lot of upper body movement when you're paddling a boat. So, I hope, hope this helps. Uh, again, if you're going to be out in one of those inflatable boats, please, please carry two things. Carry an anchor. That's a 10-pound anchor. That's more than enough for any inflatable boat I've ever been in. And get you one of those pumps. You know, you can get one for less than $10. Go to Walmart, Kmart, places like that. Probably Toys R Us. We're not talking about a bicycle pump. You want one of those things that's got a big cylinder on it, probably three and a half, four inch diameter cylinder. And it puts out a lot of air, even on the downstroke as well as the upstroke. The clerk will be able to show you where they're at. They're made for filling up rafts and inflatable boats and things like that. Okay, maybe uh, next time I go down to Lake Benson, they have John boats down there. I'll take my camera. And before I start fishing, I'll jump out on the bow of that thing and get my partner to make a little film. And I'll, I'll demonstrate in real life how to scull a boat. And just, you know, like I said earlier, I, nobody showed me how to do it. I just started doing it. It's a very natural thing once you get that paddle in the water and start moving it around. You'll, you'll find what works best for you. It may not be exactly the way I do it myself. But it's a, a, a great technique. Man, it is so quiet. I can talk about that. I grew up in South Georgia, Southern Georgia. And down there, we, we basically fished just a few, a few simple ways. We had things we called pond worms. I guess they were really night crawlers. You didn't have to dig for them. You just rake through the pine straw and pick them up. We used big minnows that we called roaches. They were like redfin minnows, roaches. We used crawfish. We called them crawfish. And they were available in every ditch along just about every country road out there. All the drainage ditches up down around between Valdosta and Fargo. It was just flat land. So even a half inch of rain would fill those ditches up. But we would take those, those live baits, put them on a you know, pretty good fair size hook, maybe have a 12, 14 foot cane pole. And we would not have a 12 or 14 foot line, it might only be a 10 foot line. And we would scull with one arm and use our other hand to just what we call dabbling, going around lily pads, cypress stumps, things like that. We'd put the bait in. You could do this for crappy fishing. You know, if you're fishing stand in timber, this is a perfect technique. In the spring, I, I could get right up on bed and bass. I think there's something special about using that sculling paddle as opposed to a trolling motor. I've got a very quiet Minn Kota trolling motor and I put a, uh, a, a tri-blade prop on it. It's, it's even quieter than the dual blade that it came with. And as quiet as I try to be, sometimes if I get too close to a bedding fish, it's going gonna, it's gonna to spook him. But if I'm sculling, I can get close enough I can reach out and touch him with a paddle most of the time. I, th I think they're used to that kind, of, that kind of sound. Next time you're out on the lake and the wind's blowing a little bit, look around. You'll see things. You'll see what I call deadheads. You know, they're old limbs or tree trunks that aren't rooted to the bottom of the lake. They're just kind of floating vertically. And when the wind's blowing, you'll see these things moving back and forth like that, just waving around. Or, 
or a piece of debris that's floating on the water and there's a little chop, that's going to be making just a little bit of noise. Fish are accustomed to, the, to that kind of sound. What they're not accustomed to is a whirring, whirring blade. <laughs> well, most fish aren't, unless, unless they're living in one of these city ponds where you got thousands of people out there every day. Maybe then a, the sound of a motor might be just natural to them. But anyhow, I think I've sold it enough. Try sculling. Easy way to move your boat. It's very easy to maneuver in tight spaces like that. And uh, it's cheap. <laughs> you can buy a paddle, a three-foot paddle. I don't know, five, six, seven dollars, just about anywhere I would guess. And you want to have just a. Where my pal? When you buy your raft, your inflatable boat, most likely it's going to come with a set of plastic oars, and the the blade of the oar is going to be scooped. And Maybe that's pretty good for rowing that thing, but it's, it's not worth a hoot if you're going to scull. You, you don't use that, that type of paddle. Get you a, just a regular standard paddle. This is a wooden paddle. I guess composite material would be fine as long as it was the basic shape. You know, you want it blade shape. You don't want any scoops to it. Four foot. I wouldn't go any longer than four foot. If you have to go longer than four foot, you got the wrong kind of boat for sculling. Three foot would probably be perfect for me on the what I have. But since I'm not sculling, I've got the four footer. It allows me to push off off the bank when I'm launching my boat in shallow water. Okay. Hope that answers some of your questions. Hope you have fun in your your new inflatable boat or get a little more use out of your John boat. Trust Gullin. <laughs>